Hi everyone and welcome to the channel. Today we're going to be taking a look at this. It's an IBM Personal Computer 300GL. Now before we start diving into the guts of it, uh, I'd just like to say that the, for me, the thing that stands out most about these was the design of them. At a time when the majority of other manufacturers were still doing sort of perfectly square angular beige boxes, IBM were just starting to mix things up a little bit. You've got this kind of moulded grill effect, um, you know, predominantly down this side here and across the front, a little bit down this side too. This subtle curve across the front where the floppy disk and the CD-ROM drives go. And then this sort of blue highlighting, if you like, the IBM badge, floppy disk eject button, and this main piece here. Combined, I think that these things look absolutely spot on. Let's take a closer look. The personal computer or PC line was introduced in October 1994 and it was the successor to the value point and PS2 lines. There were a number of models over the years and it lasted until October 2000 when it was succeeded by the NetVista line and indeed if you look at some of those early NetVista models you'll see a lot of design cues in them taken from these. Now those six years from October 94 to October 2000 came at a time when technology in computers was moving very quickly. Take processors for example. In October 94 a low to mid range 486 machine had been pretty typical with the early Pentiums not been out very long. By the time you get to October 2000 the fastest Pentium 3s were available uh, as were the Athlon uh, with the Thunderbird cores and the Pentium 4 would arrive just one month later. So that's a heck of a lot of technological change and development over the six years that the PC line was available. As I said earlier, this is a PC 300GL and this model came out closer to the end of the PC line than to the start. And that's reflected in the CPUs that you could get in these. They started down at an original Pentium uh, at 133 MHz and went up through the Pentiums, the Celerons, the Pentium 2s and the Pentium 3s all the way up to a P3 at 866 MHz. There were two variations, um, the desktop case that we see here, but you could also get uh, a micro tower case that retained a lot of the styling features that we see on this one. Looking at how much one of these would have cost you, well, obviously it depends on the model and, and the spec, but uh, looking at this PC Mag search result from September 1997, we can see that a 166 megahertz uh, Pentium with MMX, 32 mega RAM, two and a half gig hard disk, $1,426, which is just under two and a half thousand dollars in uh, today's money here in early 2022. Um, also, that's without monitor, so you need to have the cost of your monitor on top of that. Pretty pricey, but you know, not out of the ballpark of what businesses would uh, you know normally pay for their IT. I, I wouldn't have thought. Taking a look at the uh, overall condition of this thing, it's not too bad. It seems to have survived shipping okay. Um, just this side at the back which seems a little bit flappy. I'm guessing we've got a broken plastic catch or clip in there or something, but I'm sure that could be sorted out. On the top, just a few light scratches, uh, no doubt from where the monitor sat. Um, and overall, it's a little bit yellow, but you know, the, the scratches, the, um, the yellow in, I think that could be sorted out quite easily. It's, uh, it's pretty good. Fairly clean. But if you look close up, you can see sort of, you know, in these molded, um, sort of molded vents, if you like, and in the nooks and crannies, there's a little bit of dirt in there that'd be nice to get out. But uh, yeah, not too bad, uh, not too bad condition at all. Let's take a closer look at the front. We've got our power button uh, over here on the left, uh, underneath that, power on light, hard disk activity light, and then a third light, uh, looking at the symbol, that looks like uh, a bunch of networked computers. So I wonder if that's a sort of network activity light, like what you get next to uh, an Ethernet jack, uh, you know, on a network card or something. We'll have to have a look at that. Um, floppy disk drive in the middle with the disk eject button. 
and then over on this side uh, CD-ROM drive. Now, doesn't look original that to me, it looks a little bit aftermarket to be honest. Uh, maybe this model didn't have a CD-ROM drive originally or maybe they upgraded uh, it during its life. But yeah, it doesn't quite look right to me. Intel inside, Pentium 2 badge down here. So we know what to expect when we open this up. And then just under this overhang, there's a little tiny sticker with the model number on, which is a 6275, and serial numbers underneath that. Around the back, uh, we've got our power in here, and then on the motherboard, 25 pin parallel, two USB ports, two nine pin serials, PS2 headers for keyboard and mouse, and uh, VGA. And then on a riser, we've got what appears to be a network card where with RJ45 and what looks like uh, another 9-pin D-shaped plug. I'm um, not really too sure what that's all about. And underneath that, uh, what well, looks like a sound card with a game port built in. Strikes me as being a little bit odd uh, to have a sound card um, in a business machine of the time. Maybe they did, or again, maybe this is another upgrade that's, uh, that's been done to this. Doesn't look too bad, a uh, little bit mucky, and a tiny bit of corrosion on these slot blanking plates, but uh, nothing that couldn't be sorted out. Now, another nice thing about these cases is that IBM was starting to put a little bit of thought into their uh, sort of case design. Um, nice build quality, not as many sharp edges on them as you'd get used to get on computer cases at the time, and also uh, thought to how you used to get into these things and servicing them. So take the top off, it's nice and simple. Um, just lift these two little tabs up and shove it forward. And I'm gonna take the top off and remove it. Now it's always nice to see these sort of things inside cases. This is a label that IBM put on there. Simple uh, layout diagram of the motherboard and um, the main jumper settings in there for clearing CMOS setting um, uh, multipliers and whatnot uh, for the CPU so nice quick reference thing there save you digging out the manual if you need to uh, you know get in there and uh, change anything or have a look at something okay taking a closer look uh, as expected uh, there's our Intel Pentium 2 uh, passively cooled no uh, no fan on there just a heat sink got a single memory module in there Built-in uh, graphics card, uh, graphics chipset on the motherboard. We've got an S3 Trio. We'll take a closer look at that. And presumably uh, this is um, uh, memory expansion uh, for, for, for the graphics card. There's our network card and our sound card stacked underneath on this riser. Floppy drive here at the front. Um, CD-ROM drive over here. Um, I can just see the hard disk took down... Um, in the bottom in between and then power supply here made by AC Bell presumably or something like that under under license for IBM uh, it's a uh, 150 watt model so not, not massive amount but again fairly typical for the computers at the time intake fan here at the front and then um, exhaust um, via the power supply it's a little bit dusty in here, but not too bad. I think this is clean up without too much trouble. Certainly seeing computers uh, in a lot worse uh, condition than this. Just having a quick look, I don't see any obvious uh, signs of corrosion, but uh, let's take some of these parts out. We'll see what we've got. Here's our Pentium 2 um, in the uh, slot one configuration we've got the awesome sticker on the back uh, just like before look at that it's the processor die it's not really it's just a sticker but it's damn cool and um, going to this uh, sticker we've got on the back this is a 350 megahertz model here's the ram we've got a 64 megabytes of PC100 uh, SD RAM. Just one screw holds uh, a common cover on for all the uh, expansion cards.
There's our PCI networking card, IBM PCI token ring according to the sticker on the back. Not a lot of room uh, to get the um, sound card out with the regards to the support posts for the for the CPU. It's an ISA sound card. Come on out you come. There we are. It's a creative model CT2940. We've got game port on there, then up at the top, line in, mic in, line out, speaker out. Looks fairly cut down, a lot of chips missing here at the back, no IDE interface on there. Now, despite a lot of the capacitors on the motherboard all sort of leaning over a 45 degree angle or something, they don't look too bad at first glance. I can't see any obvious bulging ones or anything like that. We were a little bit before the main capacitor plague started to happen, I think, with the um, with the year of this. So, um, touch wood, I think those capacitors are going to be okay. CD-ROM drive is a TIAC uh, CD56E. Manufacture date is February 1996. Quick Google of that number suggests that this is a... Fifth, uh, not a 56 speed drive, that'd be absurd. A 6 speed uh, CD ROM drive. Uh, now that does fit in uh, with this sort of time period. And this is a good example of what I was saying earlier about um, IBM putting a bit of thought into um, their case designs. I've just removed two screws here that you can get out easy from the top. And the whole CD ROM and hard disk assembly flips over like this. You've got access to the hard drive and the connections on the back of the hard disk and the CD-ROM drive. You can get to those nice and easy too. Right, hopefully you can see that. Um, our hard disk is a Maxter. It's 3.2 gigabytes. And let's have a look. Does it tell us the spindle speed on there? Can't see the spindle speed, we'll have to uh, look that up. Manufactured 1999. Um, so, hmm, given the 1996 date on the CD-ROM drive, was this an original disc? Um, have we just got a large sort of span of date codes in here? Or is this uh, a replacement that's happened at some point? Uh, not sure, I'll have to take a look at that. Hopefully it's not too dark to see, but the battery is just under there. A lithium coin cell, no signs of leakage or corrosion or anything like that. Um, and if that one's flat and it's not holding charge uh, anymore, nice and easy to replace. The token ring uh, networking card. Not something I'm particularly uh, familiar with token ring, but I'm sure that we can uh, network this just by using the normal uh, RJ45 on there. If not, I've got plenty of network cards. We could bob something else in uh, to replace it. So here we have our sound card, the uh, CT2940. Now, this um, is a Vibra 16 chip here on it, which means it's essentially a Sound Blaster 16 that's been cut down and condensed. A lot of the stuff moved into this one chip. From what I understand, there were two versions of this card. One of them has a real uh, OPL3 chip on and um, is quite a nice sound card uh, to have. Unfortunately, this version has this Creative uh, FM chip on instead, which from what I understand doesn't sound quite as good as uh, a real OPL3 chip. However, overall, I think it's a pretty low noise design and um, yeah, should be a nice sound card and totally fitting for this computer here. Just getting things back together so that we can power this thing on and test it. Here's our built-in S3 uh, graphics chipset. Um, it's effectively AGP built into the motherboard. Takes up to 4 megabytes of 100 megahertz SG RAM. I say up to. Um, my guess is that there'll only be 2 megabytes on here and you'll have to put another 2 in the expansion module to get the full 4. Not a strong 3D performer uh, of its time by any means, but absolutely fine for the 2D business type applications that these things would have been intended to run. Right, we've got everything put back together, keyboard, mouse and a monitor connected. Uh, 
Let's power on. Fans are spinning up. Good sign. And we've got a picture. That was a very uh, tired sound in seek from the floppy disk. Probably not been used in a while. And we've got a bad CMOS battery, that's not unexpected, but uh, nice and easy to sort out. Okay, we're into the BIOS system summary. There's our Pentium 2 at 350 MHz with 512k of L2 cache, full 64 meg of RAM detected, as is our S3 Trio 3D video controller, floppy drive, hard disk, CD-ROM drive, all appear to be there. We've got a BIOS date there of 1999, which ties in with what we saw on the hard disk. Which is kind of odd that we'd have a CD-ROM drive from uh, three years previous to that. And yep, as expected, um, just the two meg of video memory. So the socket uh, on the motherboard is for putting another two meg in to get the full four. Right, let's try a full boot. the sounds of that old hard disk uh, chugging away coming through on video it sounds fantastic and uh, we've got Windows NT version 4 yep Windows NT workstation 4.0 right it seems we've got some sort of novel uh, network logon client sat on top of Windows um, that could make it pretty tricky for us to uh, to log on. Oh, we've got an important notice. Do not attempt to log on unless you are an authorised user. By logging on to this system, you give permission for activities performed on this system to be monitored for content, quality, he, and appropriateness in accordance with the FDRL security standards. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm sure they'll let us off. Now, I don't know the username and password for this, um, but even if I did, wouldn't this software try and authenticate that with uh, you know with a sort of server of something like that? So I think this causes a bit of a problem in that we're not going to be able to log on to this machine. I mean, after all, the whole point of this Novell software is to only let authenticated users log on. But at least we can see that all the important bits appear to be working as they should be. Right then, I think we're going to leave it there for part one on this 300GL. I'll spend a bit more time off camera seeing if I can get around that Novell logon, but I think we're going to have to format this and reinstall the OS. Now, need to have a little bit of a think about whether or not that's uh, Windows NT4 again or something else, because if we stick with NT4 that might limit us a little bit of what we can put on here to sort of show the computer off. But before we worry about that, we'll give this thing uh, a bit of a clean up first. Don't think it's desperate for a Retrobrite, but get these scratches out of the top, get all the dust out of it, get the muck out, these grooves and whatnot. But all that'll be coming up in part two. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, give us a thumbs up and a comment and all that good stuff down below. But for now, I'm just going to say thank you very much for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.